show. Thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate that. Today's show I call New Light, a prophecy that Jehovah is directing the organization. We're talking today about old light and new light. Now you might be wondering, what on earth am I talking about? Well, have you ever had a conversation with one of Jehovah's Witnesses when you were talking to them about one of the organization's failed predictions? And the person that you're talking to, the JW, just sloughed it off like it was nothing, like it was old light, and then they told you that they've now received new light on it? I know I have had this happen to me. In fact, when I was a Jehovah's Witness, that's exactly what I used to say. 1975? Oh, that's old light. We've got new light on that now. You know, if somebody whom you really respected told you again and again that something was going to happen, and then it never happened, at what point would you throw in the towel and say, oh, this person's out to lunch? Would you wait five years, 10, 20 years, 30? The problem with being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is that the longer you're in the organization and the more sacrifices you make for the organization, the harder it is to leave, no matter how many times the organization proves to be wrong. And they don't even bat an eye when they tell you, oh, that's old light. So just what exactly does old light and new light mean? Well, when Jehovah's Witnesses say this to you, they're referring to a scripture in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. You see, they believe that God is using their organization to give out spiritual information or light that becomes brighter or clearer as time goes on. And they also believe that old light, or sorry, new light cannot contradict old light. But it simply adds to it and it makes it all clear. Why don't we have a look at this scripture so you know what I'm talking about. So we see the, the verse here at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, where it says, But the path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that goes brighter and brighter until full daylight. So we see this verse is comparing the path of righteous ones to morning light that gets brighter and brighter. Is this a prophecy about spiritual doctrinal matters being made clearer over time? JW Org says it does. Check out here the May 15th, 1995 Watchtower. So they are saying here that Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18 refers to this revealing of spiritual truths that has taken place gradually by means of flashes of light. Yet when I read that scripture, I don't see that point. Do you? So why don't we take a look at the entire chapter to get the context. So we're looking here at the first 13 verses of Proverbs chapter 4. He's saying there to, you know, listen to discipline, keep my commandments and continue living as it will protect you. Listen, it will lead you in the tracks of uprightness. And here now we're looking at, at the remaining part of this chapter, where again, he's saying here now, the wicked do not walk in the way of evil men. We see that verse there in verse 18 that we read earlier, how the wicked is like the darkness, that we need to gaze straight ahead of you, turn your feet away from what is bad. And this is, the, this is the gist of it. So when you read through Proverbs chapter 4, you see that it's basically a comparison of behavior between a wicked man who is like the darkness and a righteous man whose path keeps getting brighter. And that's it. Using it as a prophecy of doctrinal changes by their organization is taking it completely out of context. The weird thing is that when I was a witness, that verse never did quite make sense to me when we used it as an excuse for doctrinal errors and changes to the organization. But I just accepted it. It was a matter of right or wrong, just go along. And I never really thought about it or even questioned it. We could ask ourselves these questions though. Is Watchtower Doctrine getting brighter or is it just changing? Is the new light that they are giving out evidence that it is coming from God? Or is it evidence that it is coming from men? Well, what I'm about to show you is that the new light that the organization is giving is actually not getting brighter, but that it is just changing. In fact, it is flip-flopping all over the place. Let's first of all take a look briefly at their stand on blood. Take a look at this slide from the jwfacts.com website. So we're looking here at a chart that shows the history of accepted blood components. We see prior to 1945, everything was allowed, whole blood, major blood fractions, and minor blood fractions. 
But then starting in 1945, nothing was allowed. No whole blood, no major blood fractions, no minor blood fractions. Then between 1982 and 2000, they made some changes. Whole blood was still not allowed, major blood fractions not allowed, but minor blood fractions, some were allowed. And then post-2000, whole blood was not allowed, major blood was not allowed, but then they made a flip-flop and minor blood fractions are allowed the same way as they were prior to 1945. So does this look like an example to you of increasing light or rather flip-flopping? Does it appear that Jehovah is behind this? And if, and if you still believe that he is behind it, why did he wait until 1945 to forbid blood transfusions? They were mastered in 1916, yet it supposedly took God almost another 30 years to prohibit them. And then he spent another 55 years flip-flopping on blood fractions. But now what about the Generation of 1914 teaching? I could do an entire video series on the changes that have been made on this. We've certainly seen our fair share of changes. But have we seen evidence of the light increasing? Well, let's take a look here at some excellent information I found again on the jwfacts.com website. So the question, to whom does the generation that will not pass away apply? We can see all kinds of different answers to that, that the society has had over the years. In 1897, they first said it applied to a contemporary worldly people. Then in 1927, they said no, it was the anointed. In 1951, they brought it back to being worldly people. In 1995, they agreed, yes, it is contemporary worldly people. But then in 2008, they said no, it's the anointed. And 2010, again, they said it was the anointed. So if we want to look all together at a chart that was done on the uh, jwfacts.web website, it's absolutely excellent to see all the changes that have been made. So we were just talking on the far right column, whom it applies to, and those are all the different changes that have been made over the years. If you look here at the first column, the start date, first they said, um, up, up to 1914, they said it was 1878. Then later on, they said the start date of the generation was 33 AD. Then it was 1914, then it was back to 33 AD, then it was back to 1914, flip-flop, flip-flop. The length of time of this generation as well has flipped between 36 and a half years to the end of 1914, then it was 1900 years and then some, then it was a single lifespan. If you look down at the bottom, they're now saying it's two lifespans. The thing that I find the most disturbing about the generation teaching is that a lot of people have been disfellowshipped because they didn't agree with what the organization was saying about the generation. But clearly by looking at that last table, we see that the organization doesn't know what the generation means. They don't know who it applies to. They don't know when it should be. They keep tying it to 1914, which is why they've got this now overlapping or what I like to call the overflopping generation because it's been flip-flopping all over the place. And they don't know what this generation means. And now they're stuck on this over-flopping, overlapping generation teaching because they're hell-bent on hanging on to the fact that they believe it should be tied to 1914. But that generation has clearly died. So we're not seeing evidence of the light getting brighter, but rather it's all murky and flip-floppy. But if you want to see flip-flopping at its finest, You've got to check out this next portion about what the organization had to say about those who were killed in Sodom and Gomorrah and whether or not these ones would be given a resurrection. Check out these slides. So we see starting here with Charles Taze Russell's idea that they would be resurrected from his studies in the scriptures that it says our Lord teaches that the Sodomites did not have a full opportunity and he guarantees some such opportunity. In the 1913 Watchtower, it says, This shows us clearly that the eternal fate of the Sodomites is not sealed. We have abundant testimony that the Sodomites will not only be awakened from the sleep of death, but when awakened, will be brought to a knowledge of God and to an opportunity of obtaining everlasting life. Then again, in the 1920 Watchtower, the scriptures distinctly tell us that the Israelites and the Sodomites will be sharers in the work of restoration, restitution. But then the organization said that they would not be resurrected. In the 1941 Watchtower, it says Sodom and Gomorrah were reduced to complete desolation from which there is no possibility of recovery. Again in the 1952 Watchtower, the ancient destructions Sodom and Gomorrah must be just as final. 
1952, the Watchtower said, Sodom did not endure its judgment day. They had had their fair share, their fair judgment trial, and by their decision showed they were worthy of eternal destruction. And again in 1954, Sodom and Gomorrah were irrevocably condemned and destroyed beyond any possible recovery. But then the organization flipped again because it says that they will be resurrected in the 1965 Watchtower. So the spiritual recovery of the dead people of Sodom is not hopeless. And again, we see from a 1965 Watchtower, from the questions and readers there, it says that Sodom and Gomorrah it would be necessary for former inhabitants of that land to be present on Judgment Day. Then we see that they flipped again because they said that they would not be resurrected. In the 1967 Watchtower, they were saying then that uh, they will be burned up, root and branch, as completely gone forever as the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, never to be rebuilt. It is destruction in Gehenna in which God destroys both body and soul. But then they changed again. In 1974, they said they would be resurrected. God's undeserved kindness and care are so great that he will bring back the people of Sodom by a resurrection. And did they stick with that? No, because then in 1988, they said that they would not be resurrected again. Sodom and Gomorrah, those whom God executed in those past judgments, experienced irreversible destruction. But it didn't end with that. They changed again. They said that they would be resurrected. We see in 1988, in the Insight in the Scriptures, they say there are at least some of the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah will receive a resurrection. And then, let's look again, and then they said that they would not be resurrected. We see here from 1990, Watchtower, it says Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of the gross sinners in those cities was eternal. Those who are judged unworthy of a resurrection are pitched into Gehenna or the Lake of Fire, and among those would be those of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that, I guess, is where they stand right now. So a little summary here of will the Sodomites be resurrected? Yes, 1886. No, 18, 1941. Yes, 1965. No, 1967. Yes, 1974. No, 1988. Yes, later on in 1988. And no, from 1990. So is this an example of increasing light? Is this an example that Jehovah is backing the organization? Is this an example that JW Org is governed by a bunch of men who can't seem to make up their minds? I mean, this kind of flip-flopping is still going on. We see from the May 2016 Watchtower, they have an article where they say that you are now allowed to clap when somebody who has been uh, disfellowshipped is reinstated when they make the announcement. Yes, I know how in insane that sounds. We are now allowed to clap. May I clap? Yes? No. May I clap now? Okay, good. You know, it's not scriptural. It's not doctrinal. It's simply just a matter of control. And they can't leave it in Jehovah's hands. No, they have to be the ones to make this discernment, this, this decision that you can or cannot clap. So there was a time when we were allowed to clap, but then along came, uh, as you're looking on the screen here, there was a kingdom ministry from February of 2000 that actually refers to a watchtower of October 1st, 1998. We see that the question is asked, is it appropriate to applaud when a reinstatement is announced? And the, the gist of it is that they say applause at the time of his or her reinstatement would not be appropriate. So they'd make an announcement that brother or sister so-and-so had just been reinstated. And we all just sat there in silence like complete idiots. I mean, it was so unnatural and so uncomfortable. It was kind of like this. I'll do a little reenactment for you. The body of elders would like to announce that brother Reed Pentant has just been reinstated. Yes, it was uncomfortable and ridiculous as that. 
<laughs> we were treated like robots. Don't have any emotions, just smile and nod like an idiot. But now I see they flipped again, according to the May 2016 Watchtower. They now say that it is okay to clap. So the question is asked, how can the congregation express its joy when an announcement is made that someone has been reinstated? Well, it basically says that when someone is reinstated in the congregation, we have good reason to rejoice. There may well be spontaneous, dignified applause when the elders make an announcement of a reinstatement. So those are just a few examples of the many flip-flops that the organization has been teaching, though there are so many more I could have shown you. But we've seen that even when it comes to doctrinal matters, the JW organization has been teaching falsehoods. Yes, falsehoods, although they would never call it that. But what do you call something that isn't true? Well, I'll show you what the organization calls it. We see here from the 1993 Awake magazine, it says Jehovah's Witnesses, in their eagerness for Jesus' second coming, have suggested dates that turned out to be incorrect. You know, there's just so many things wrong with that quote, I don't even know where to begin. First of all, you notice how the organization blames the members? They say Jehovah's Witnesses in their eagerness. They don't say that the organization in its eagerness. So right off the bat, they're blaming the members. But of course, the members are getting these false dates and false things to preach about from the organization. It wasn't their fault that falsehoods were being taught. They're the victims here. Secondly, these dates were not suggested, they were insisted upon. And if you dare to disagree, you would have been disfellowshipped. And thirdly, they say that the dates turned out to be incorrect. Well, that's true, they were incorrect. But notice they never call their mistakes falsehoods or false prophecies. Yet when other religions do the exact same thing, look how quick they are to call it that. Look what the Watchtower has to say here. From the 1968 Awake magazine, the October 8th issue, it says, True, there have been those in times past who predicted an end to the world, even announcing a specific date, yet nothing happened. The end did not come. They were guilty of false prophesying. Why? What was missing? Missing from such people were God's truths and the evidence that he was guiding and using them. <laughs> we see that this is a complete double standard. One thing I learned from doing my research for this video is that Jehovah's Witnesses aren't the only organization that hide behind the new light excuse to try to avoid being called false prophets. I learned that the Mormons, the Christadelphians, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Church of God, and I'm sure there are others who also do this. Notice from the February 1st, 2013 Watchtower magazine, it talked about this young Mormon uh, gentleman who had some questions and he consulted with responsible Mormon church leaders. It says, I was told that the answers to my questions involved mysteries that one day would be solved as the light became brighter. And notice the next paragraph or the next sentence there says, disappointed by their explanation, I looked more closely at myself and, and some of his reasons. But you know, even he saw that that was kooky and he didn't find that to be a very good explanation. You know, it's a huge cop-out to say that false teachings are simply just old light. And when something proves to be false, then it was never really light, but darkness. And constant changes to doctrines and various teachings and various flip-flopping that goes on is an indication that the organization is not ruled by Jehovah God, but that in fact it is governed by men. This is exactly what Charles Russell said in a February 1881 Watchtower magazine. He said, if we were following a man, undoubtedly it would be different with us. Undoubtedly one human idea would contradict another, and that which was light one or two or six years ago would be regarded as darkness now. But with God there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, and so it is with truth. Any knowledge or light coming from God must be like its author. A new view of truth never can contradict a former truth. New light never extinguishes older light, but adds to it. And he was right. And as we've seen from the scripture in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, there's nothing to lead us to believe that this verse is some kind of a prophecy that the Jehovah's Witnesses organization would progress over time. In fact, from based on the evidence and what I've shown you in this video, 
the organization has, instead of increasing their light and becoming more clear over time, they have flip-flopped and reverted to previous teachings time and time again. So from the scripture in Proverbs, are they more like a path that leads to uprightness and, and clarity? Or a path that leads the wrong way, flip-flopping all over the place into darkness and murkiness? Always remember that as the Bible says, God cannot lie. When Jehovah says something's going to happen, it happened. Like, for example, when he said that Jerusalem would be destroyed within that one generation. And it was. Uh, there was no overlapping, overflopping, overcrapping generation that ex somehow extended it to be like a secondary generation. It's nothing like that. So that's it for today's video. I'm on a roll here, but I'm going to stop right now. Um, I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you liked it, then like it. Oh, and you can clap now, too. Even the JW organization says that you can. Thank you very much. And now we have a word from our sponsor. Brought to you by the Clapper. Clap on, clap off, the Clapper.